So here's a rundown of the future coming attractions. Uh, September 26th is going to be a biggie. Dr. Clay Stuckey, an old friend and classmate of mine, is going to give a, a, a history of the old Bloomington High School campus. I think a lot of you are familiar with that. How many went to the old BHS, the old Bloomington High School? Wow. Well, you, I expect you all to be here for that. So. Uh, there'll be a big crowd for that anyway. I guarantee you that. October 31st, uh, we have Rod Spa. He's going to give a program on Bloomington's Feltus family called Printers, Politicians, Actors, and Circus Folk. November 28th, Duncan Campbell, who's given three or four programs before, will give a program called the Indiana Barn in Transition. Uh, January 2nd, Roz Gersman is going to give a history on the, uh, the history of Smithville. Smith, it's called Smithville. Indians, Pioneers, Ski Bows, and Lake Monroe. Uh, this, <laughs> this presentation will introduce you to the family names and individuals that helped that area of Monroe County flourish and introduce education and sports. January 30th, Dr. John Butler will also return and do a program called Depots, Platforms, and Flag Stops, a history of railroad places in Monroe County. February 27th, which will mark our 11th anniversary, uh, Jill Vance will give a program called To Build a Reservoir, The Origin of Monroe Lake. March 26th, Nan Brewer, who's one of the chief curators at the Eskenazi uh, Museum of Art, uh, will be here to give a program called The History of the IU School of Fine Arts and the Museum's Collections. I look forward to that. April 30th, Christine Friesel will return to give a program called Who's Your Character? A Digital Map of the 19th Century. May 28th, Dr. Roger Robinson, MD, will give a program uh, called uh, Sports Related State Championship Teams from Monroe County's High Schools, 1904 to 2014. There are quite a few of them. Uh, June 25th, this is kind of up in here, I'm not sure. It might be a, a story on the history of the University High School, which I've been looking into. I uh, have to see if we can find somebody ready, willing, and able. Maybe Sharon could do that one. I don't know. <laughs> July 30th, Catch TV is going to do a program that kind of celebrates their 50th, 50th year of being in operation around here. And uh, August 27th, I just talked to a fellow named Kurt Sylvester, who's a, a genealogy expert from up in Fort Wayne, and he's going to give a program, I think, on, you know, on genealogy, his special, specialty. So uh, that brings us to today. Uh, uh, this is going to be a history of uh, the History Center and that, that uh, plot of land where it sits. On the, the corner of 6th and Washington has a long history in uh, Bloomington, but uh, always is a, a center for learning. First is the Center School, then the Colored School, then the Monroe County Public Library, and finally the Monroe County History Center. The site has always worked to better our community through education and knowledge. The staff of the History Center will share the history, current events at the center, and the role of the museum in our community. And uh, you know, that include Daniel Schlegel, Hillary Fleck, and Justin Robertson. And we'll begin that now. And uh, Daniel will have a few remarks to make and then introduce his own program. And if we can get a round of applause for Michael, he works really hard on this. Um, so I just have a couple quick things I just wanted to touch base with uh, before we get started on our presentation. I just wanted to remind everybody we are still collecting for our garage sale. So if anyone has donations they'd like to downsize or anything they just don't want from a very late spring cleaning, um, we are absolutely happy to accept your donations for our garage sale. And then the sale will be coming up in early November. So we will have more on that. And then uh, just a, also a reminder that uh, we have a lot of memberships. So after our presentation, if you're not a member, hopefully you'll be so excited. You, will, you just can't wait to come over and, and get a membership. But there's a lot of great benefits, so please feel free to ask us about that. And then um, I have some books as usual, but then we also just last week got some new mugs in that are extra fancy compared to our regular ones. So feel free to either stop by the History Center and check out those mugs in the store, or I brought a few over here to the table to my left. 
So I, that's all I have, but I, we've been looking forward to this. Michael is the one who suggested we do this. And so luckily at the History Center, we have some amazing staff members and two of them have agreed to do this presentation. So I'm very lucky that both our operations manager, Justin Robertson, and our curator, Hillary Fleck, are gonna be joining me up here for this presentation. So um, we're really excited. We have some of our other staff members here in support. And I know from the faces in the crowd, there's a lot of volunteers, board members, and former board members. So hopefully everyone will learn something new. So I'll go ahead and turn this over to Justin, who's gonna go ahead and get us started with the presentation. Thank you, Daniel. Hello, can everybody hear me? I know that people have been having a hard time back over there, but okay. Let me know. I, I'm usually too loud, so if I am, please let me know. So once again, my name is Justin Robertson. I'm the operations manager at the History Center. I'm a Bloomington native and uh, born and raised here. And I never from Bloomington High School. If there's before, you might have gone with my parents, Richard Robertson. You remember when you were born. You can't be that old. Come on. <laughs> yes, yeah, so um, thank you for coming, and I'm very excited about uh, the History Center and about being here today. I actually have my own history with the History Center because years ago when I was in college, I was an intern there, and then years later, I volunteered there for a couple of years, and then now I'm on staff, and I absolutely love it there. So. It's a wonderful place to be, and I hope that you all come and visit us. So today I'm going to be talking about the history of the location that is on 6th and Washington. So the corner lot of 6th and Washington Streets in Bloomington has a long and storied history, but amazingly throughout the years, this particular site has continually been an asset to our community by fostering places of learning and edif edification to this very day. This charm location could have been a parking garage many times over, had some individuals and businesses had their way. Instead, this corner lot has continually been the home for structures that enrich our community through the pursuit of culture, education, and knowledge. Soon after Bloomington's incorporation as a town in 1818, the first schools were called subscription schools, and the tuition was paid for by the pupils' uh, parents. The schools were uh, held in churches, as well as in the upper stories of business buildings on the square. During the school year of 1818-1819, when Bloomington was officially surveyed, school was taught in the log cabin courthouse, and a pioneer farmer named Dudley C. Smith was the very first teacher. This arrangement conflicted with court proceedings, as you could imagine, <laughs> and it always makes me laugh thinking of little kids being in the courthouse while they're probably trying to do other business. So a log schoolhouse was built about two blocks north of the town square. Later on, further demographic, demographic growth of Bloomington required the building of a brick schoolhouse in the eastern part of the town designed to accommodate the increasing number of families living in around the downtown square center school was located at the intersection of east 6th street and washington street and provided educational services to many of the founding families of bloomington professor david eckley hunter one of bloomington's early educators played a pivotal role in the growth of bloomington's educational system uh, in the mid-19th century, he advocated the notion of separate classes divided by grade levels. And Hunter successfully persuaded the citizens of the town to convert uh, the system of graded schools. And the first grade schools were opened in September of 1863. Professor Hunter became uh, superintendent of Bloomington schools and Mrs. Margaret McCalla, who I'm sure everybody is familiar with that name from McCalla School, and some of you might have intended that, uh, was named his assistant. Margaret McCalla started her illustrious career in education fairly early. She became a teacher at the age of 17 years old. She eventually became a principal in Evansville, 
which was a rare job for a woman to hold, uh, but returned to Bloomington uh, to assist Hunter in organizing Central School. She taught at Central School before and during the Civil War, and she eventually became superintendent of Bloomington Schools in 1874, becoming the very first woman superintendent in the state of Indiana. Uh, Professor Hunter and Margaret McCullis' offices were located in the old tannery structure on the southwest corner of 2nd Street and South College Avenue on the present site of Seminary Square. In 1870, the Board of School Trustees reported the purchase of the tannery building as the site of a new high school and a new grade school. And as most of you probably know, that became the site of Bloomington High School, where I'm sure a lot of you went. According to some reports, the Center School was attended by both white and black students, with white students enrolled on the first floor of the school, while black students were enrolled in a separate, separate room on the second floor. In 1874, what became known as the Colored School opened in Center School here at the 6th and Washington Street location. The school now only served African American elementary students, because in 1869, a state law had mandated the education of African-American children with a separate enumeration and separate schools, which were supported with tax revenue within the common school system. Supposedly, the colored school opened in 1873. There's um, some literature on that, but there's actually no definite proof. Um, however, the 1876 Sanborn map shows the colored school at this location, and that's what you can see on the slide there. Uh, the reports of Indiana Superintendent of Public Instruction from 1871 to 1875 show there's enough evidence to assert with reasonable certainty that pre-high school black students were being educated at Central School in the 1874-1875 school year. The 1881 census indicated that 57 students were enrolled that year. Of these 57, 54 were between the ages of 6 and 21 years old, and 3 were over 21 years old. According to Frances Halso Gilliam in her book, A Time to Speak, A Brief History of Afro-Americans of Bloomington, Indiana, the ages of the students is not unusual because many students were young adults at the time school grading became pop popular, and many of the students also held jobs and were otherwise mature. Two of the best known colored school teachers were Mr. T.C. Johnson, who was the last principal. He also taught grades four, five, and six, and Miss Mary Todd Newman, a Bloomington woman who taught grades one, two, and three. Mr. Johnson has been uh, described by former students as a wonderful man, but a very strict disciplinarian. And Mrs. Newman has been spoken of as being much beloved by her former students. After over 40 years, the colored school permanently closed in 1913, and the students were schooled in the old armory building on College Avenue and Third Street. On January 23rd, 1915, according to the Bloomington City School Board minutes, the Building Committee of the Public Library Board submitted a request to the Board of Education to purchase the lot, and the colored school was on, uh, uh, purchased the lot that the colored school was on <laughs> for the erection of a public library for Bloomington. The lot was eventually sold to the library in 1915. For years, the need for a new library had been on an ongoing struggle because the local library was first housed in a single room in the log courthouse, then later in a small building behind the courthouse on the square. And that building, you can see the old courthouse, and the building behind it was the library. And behind that are um, the outhouses. So times have certainly changed. Uh, <laughs> not for the worse. <laughs> In the late 1800s, there was a progressive local women's professional club called the Cirrhosis Club, whose aim was to promote mental activity and ple pleasant social intercourse, which was a wonderful aim. 
And in 1887, this club was successful in asking Andrew Carnegie uh, about a building grant for a new and modern library. A local referendum included a question about accepting Carnegie's offer. The ballot included additional community uh, financing needs and the offer was rejected. Yeah. <laughs> in 1915, with the pending purchase of the lot, the Women's Club approached Carnegie again. And after several years of negotiations and variable local support, the Carnegie Corporation submitted a pro proposal of a grant of 28000 This amount was rejected by the library board, who requested $40,000. Subsequently, the Carnegie Corporation was persuaded to increase its grant to $31,000. And this is what the current building was built for, $31,000. That's just amazing, but that was a lot of money at the time. With this $31,000 grant in hand, the library board planned to construct an architecturally significant building, and they chose Wilson B. Parker, an Indianapolis-based architect who had already designed numerous Carnegie libraries in Indiana. Parker utilized the region's abundant limestone and constructed the building out of large blocks of limestone, a luxury that even in 1917 was only avail available for public buildings in major cities and for the homes of the very rich. Today, the library is one of only few in our community built out of solid blocks of limestone instead of out of stone veneers. So it's a very important building to our community. Parker's neoclassical design incorporated elements of principles that Carnegie believed in. The massive fanlight over the main entrance was a half circle in, in honor of Carnegie's request for doorways to be surmounted by images of the rising sun, a symbol of the door to knowledge and learning. And the prominent entrance accessed by a stairwell symbolizes a person's elevation by learning. Parker's design also incorporated other ideas that Carnegie held dear, such as the addition of an auditorium to accommodate civic and cultural activities with its own exterior entrance so that there was access after the library had closed. When it opened in 1918, the library had almost 2,000 books and 400 people attended its opening. The library stayed open in this location for over 50 years, serving thousands of people and being a beloved asset to the community. Eventually, the library outgrew its facilities in the Carnegie Building and in 1970 relocated their collection to where it is now on Kirkwood. Of course, it has been expanded since that time as well. The preservation of the library building <laughs> is a really complex story that is difficult to summarize. As such, it is neither straightforward nor short-winded, and I don't have time to go into it today. <laughs> um, but in fact, it should be considered for an entire history club subject of its own at some point. Uh, but while I will attempt to provide the most pertinent informa information, it is important to note that this, this is a very condensed account. The old library, as it had come to be known, stood vacant for seven long years with local politicians, local businesses, and local community members all disagreeing about the building's value, whether it was just an old, decrepit ruin, and what they should do about its future. Almost immediately after the library vacated the premises, Mayor Hooker's plans for a $2.7 million parking program slated the library site as the location for a parking garage. However, due to indictments against Mayor Hooker and the city controller over illegal funding and non-appropriated funds and other parking garage projects, these plans never materialized and the building was thankfully saved. However, it continued to be threatened with demolition to be used as a parking lot over the years, with Mayor McCloskey advocating for its demolition as late as 1977. He later changed his tune on that and was pretty instrumental in saving it. With an empty piece of property on their hands, the library board sought another tenant and the battle to determine the fate 
of the building begins. These are just a few of the things that uh, were possibilities as to what to do with the library at the time. Local philanthropist uh, Kathy Canada proposed purchasing the library for a cultural center and exchanging her ownership of People's Park to the city as part of the deal. But a city council member opposed the deal, wanting the city to have ownership of the property and to turn it into a history museum. Uh, First Christian Church also wanted the property, and they even made a deposit on it. Um, they actually had plans to renovate the building, but the building had become in such disrepair that it could have been too costly that they also had an out and uh, asked for a possible demolition permit um, if their uh, renovations were too expensive, and they wanted to turn the site into a parking lot as well. And Workingmen's federal savings proposed buying the property in order to demolish the building and provide a nearby parking lot for their 27 employees. So <laughs> we are very lucky that this site is not a parking lot. I mean, we need parking, but this building is way too valuable. Though first formed in 1905, the present Monroe County Historical Society was incorporated on May 1st, 1973, and registered with the state of Indiana. The Historical Society needed a place to house its genealogy library for many years. In 1980, Tolly, the old library, Inc., purchased the historic Carnegie site from the city of Bloomington and started renovations. The Historical Society leased space from Tolly and moved its genealogy library into the facility in 1981. The Tolley organization was dissolved in 1994 and the building was eventually sold to the Monroe County Historical Society for just one dollar. And it subsequently became a fantastic, if I may say so myself, museum, <laughs> featuring a hundred displays for visitors to see, including Monroe the Bear from Schmaltz's department store. If anybody remembers that, um, I was always brought there by my grandmother to buy shoes, and uh, the bear scared me senseless, and to this day, my colleagues can tell you I will not walk under him when I'm turning out the lights. <laughs> but it's great that we have him. Um, as well as we had several items that would be on loan from local museums, including the Glenn Black Lab from IU. Um, the History Center also had many quilt shows that were very popular, and it continued to grow, grow and renovations continued as the needs were identified. By the late 1990s, more building space was needed to accommodate the collection and to build staff op offices. Subsequently, the society sought to expand the facility and following a successful Build History fundraising campaign, 12,000 square feet were added to the existing building between 1997 and 1998. Now the historical center has 8,000 square feet of exhibit galleries, an expansion of the genealogy and local history research lab, a museum shop, and an education and event room. And I'd like to close with a quote from Elizabeth Schlemer's senior honors paper from IU titled, The Old Library Debate, How Bloomington Preserved Its Historic Carnegie Library. She writes, as the memories of an older generation of Bloomington citizens who recall walking through its stores to check out a book fade, new attachments and associations to this space are also formed. Children of Bloomington's 21st century will later remember how they came to the museum on class trips to sit in a one-room schoolhouse or walk through a real log cabin on exhibit, or they, how they came for ice cream sundaes one su Saturday a month. The building is still a place where people come to connect to each other and to their community's past. Thank you. I will now turn it over to our curator, Hilary Fleck. Okay, 
Okay, hello everyone. Uh, I'm Hilary Fleck. I'm the curator at the History Center, and today I am the ghost of Christmas present, and I'm going to talk about the History Center today and what it does today. Our mission for the Monroe County Historical uh, Society that runs the History Center is to collect, preserve, research, interpret, and present the history and culture of Monroe County, Indiana, and make it accessible for everyone. So we take that very seriously and we do our very best every single day in everything that we do, all of our programs, all of our exhibits, uh, that we keep this mission at heart. And this is um, the basis of what we use to design our exhibits uh, and prepare our programs. Um, so what can you do at the History Center? Well, one of the main things you can do there is research. Um, I'm sure many of you already are aware of this, but if there's anybody who's never been to the History Center before, um, we have a research genealogy library, and you can <laughs> research your family history, uh, birth records, marriage records, land deeds, probate records, anything. If you, your family member was here in Monroe County for even a brief period of time, we probably have a record of it, and uh, we can help you fill out your family tree and... Uh, you know, add a few more names to, um, to that list. We also have a lot of city and county history files, uh, not just genealogy and family history. We also have topics, buildings, industries, uh, events that have happened, um, many different files and schools, educate like all of the uh, schoolhouses that are no longer around. We have information on them, photographs of them. Um, so any kind of thing that you're interested in, we probably have something for that. Uh, we have maps and records that if you're interested in what, who owned your property before, we could find that out. Um, we could also find what, what is that building that looks like it used to maybe be a church? What is that building? And it was like, oh, well, it was a church at one point in time, and this is the church that it was, and that sort of thing. So if you're ever interested, uh, curious about those sorts of things, please stop by. And also, one of the most popular things that we have is yearbooks. So um, a lot of local school yearbooks, um, elementary and high school yearbooks, um, and IU yearbooks that we have. What's the oldest one we have? Do you know, Megan? 18, 1890 something. I want you to say 1893 was probably the oldest IU yearbook that we have. Um, but if you're interested in finding uh, researching anybody, that's also really helpful for genealogy research. If you happen to know that your family member did go to school here, they were in this school um, for this period, they graduated in this year, or they went to IU for this period of time, we could probably find a photograph of them, which is very helpful. <clears throat> the collections. So before I was the curator, um, I was the collection manager at the Monroe County History Center. So. Um, I'm very familiar with what we have in our collection and what we do and what we don't have as well. Um, we have over 200 years of history and in Monroe County and hopefully something to relate to everything. Um, we have over 70,000 individual objects in our collection, which is huge for a museum our size. But we do have um, those individual items mean like a postcard and then also as large as a log cabin. So the, the size can vary uh, greatly, but everything that we have in our collection relates somehow to Monroe County and helps us build our exhibits and tell the story of, of um, the history of Monroe County. The donation process. So we accept donations to our museum collection every single day. Uh, well, except for Sundays and Mondays because we're closed. Um, but you uh, are free to donate anything that you want considered for the museum collection um, any day that we're open, uh, Tuesday through Saturday from 10 a.m. to 4 p.m. That's a little plug. Um, we do ask that you fill out a temporary custody form. This form can be found on our website, but also we have it at the History Center. So if you don't have a printer at, or a computer at home, we have forms for you to fill out at the History Center, too. This simple form, it's just two pages, uh, is your contact information, so I can get in contact with you again about your items, and then just a brief history of your items. Where, where did they come from? Did, what, do they, what do they relate to? Um, 
is there some sort of uh, family history that we need to know about? Um, is there a certain family significance that you would like to share? Uh, all of that is very, very helpful for us to build our exhibits off of. Because for me, not being a member of your family, I might look at a quilt and be like, okay, that's a very pretty quilt, but it's just a quilt to me. Or, but to you, that could be a quilt that your great grandmother made for her daughter on her wedding day, and they ended up having uh, 17 children or something like that. It was <laughs> so that family history and that family significance is important to you and important to share whenever you're donating those sorts of items. Um, so, filling out that temporary custody form is important. Um, also, we have a collections committee, which Mike is on. Hey, um, but the collections committee meets once a month and we discuss all of the donations that have come in over the past month. And this uh, committee is made up of dedicated community volunteers and uh, lifelong volunteers, uh, residents of Monroe County. And so they know a lot more information and they can, they can um, know backstory and connections of people that I might not know, that might not have been shared. Uh, with the custody form, um, and so that's very helpful for all of us is to be like, oh yeah, there's so and so's cousin who used to be who used to work for showers. That's how that's why you have this thing. I'm like, oh okay. So um, when the committee when the committee approves the the item for donation, then uh, myself and my uh, Gabby, our assistant curator, and our curatorial volunteers and interns then begin processing the items into our collection. So as you can see, this is a photo of our uh, fo section of our collection storage. And so this is where we process them. We, I, we clean any items that need to be cleaned and then add them to our computer database so that we can find them again and, uh, and find them a good home in storage where they can live until they go out on display. So uh, what are we interested in? I get this uh, question quite a lot is like, what, what do you want? And I'm like, well, I don't know what I want because I don't know what you have. I don't know what anybody has. So um, we take pretty much anything. It's, um, it's all, it just needs to relate to Monroe County somehow. Um, so that does mean that hopefully it was used by someone who lived here in Monroe County, belonged to someone in Monroe County, relates to a schoolhouse or a business or um, something along those lines. Uh, what, what, I, what I don't take, I don't take everything though. I, I, will, I will look at anything, but I won't take everything because we do not accept family Bibles. That is something that we do not take um, because Bibles don't change much. Um, and so the, the text is pretty much the same. Um, and then what we, but what people do keep in their family Bibles is their genealogy information. So uh, we will make copies of the genealogy information and that will go into our genealogy um, files and our research library, but we will not take the Bibles themselves. Um, and then we do also do not take newspapers. I know that seems counterproductive considering an exhibit that we currently have, but uh, newspapers tend to deteriorate over time and um, there's no way to stop that process. Um, and instead of a long, slow march to death, they're actually going at a very quick pace towards death. So uh, we tend to not accept newspapers and we will take clippings and we will copy them, um, but we will not take physical newspapers. And we do not collect those. <clears throat> Here, uh, I've decided to do a few examples of what we have recently collected. <clears throat> so this is a 1997 RCA stereo system with a five CD changer, which is so cool. Um, my CD changer was just a three CD changer when I was little, so I was like, this is awesome. Um, surround sound speakers, and included a remote, a manual, and the receipt of purchase, because this was never, ever used. Brand new, in the box, and the box was never open. So Kent Lawson, um, it belonged to his parents, who worked at RCA, and apparently they won some sort of employee contest that they were offered this stereo and they didn't use it. Um, so they just picked it up and I, we still have the receipt of uh, them picking it up from the warehouse and all of that in 1997. Um, and 
they just put it in their garage, I guess. It's, it's in mint condition, never been used. So it's really exciting and we're really happy to have something like this, especially in the condition that it's in. Being electronics, it's always difficult to keep and preserve electronics in a good, good condition, so we're really excited about this. Will we ever use it? I don't know. I don't know, but it looks great. <laughs> Next, we have the um, Stanger family reunion. So this is only a fraction of the photo because it is a quite a large panoramic photo um, because there are several hundred Stangers in, in this family. But Eagley Stanger, Stanger um, this is her 55th birthday on September 10th, uh, 1925. And as far as I can tell, most everybody in this photo has a name. They, uh, on the back side of the, of the photo frame, they were typed, they had a typed out name list. So nearly everybody is named, which is astounding for a genealogy record. Um, but from what I can tell by counting people, uh, I'm not entirely sure though, but I think this is equally, I think. I'm not entirely sure though. It's, she's somewhere here and that looks like a 55 year old to me. <laughs> so I was like, maybe that's her. <coughs> So yeah, it's great, um, and all of this information, so the photograph is added to our museum collection, and then a copy and the genealogy record of names is added to the family files. So uh, future Stangers uh, can find their past Stangers. Another new donation is a photo of the Templeton family. Um, Frank, Frank, Gladys, uh, Ruth, Ralph and Martha, um, circa 1940. Um, the date, the photograph didn't have a date, but I'm guessing because of the age of the children and census records that this is about 1940. And Frank Templeton was an administrator with the Bloomington Metropolitan School System at the time. And um, he is the gentleman that Templeton Elementary School on Henderson and Henderson and Hillside Henderson and Hillside <laughs> is named after. So that is Frank. And there are many other photographs in yearbooks of Frank at his desk doing his job. He um, was apparently the director of testing and statistics for the school district. Um, but in, oh, I didn't write this down. Um, but later on, not in 1940, a, couple, a few years later, he, the school was renamed um, after him. Okay, so this is not a new donation, but this is new information to the History Center. So this is another example of um, you can donate your items, your physical items, or you can just donate the knowledge that you have in your brain. Um, because <laughs> this, is, um, this item was donated by the Victor Olytic Stone Company um, in 2003, I think. Um, and we had no idea what was, I mean, other than the obvious, there is a limestone carver carving limestone. Um, so we had no idea what was going on. Uh, a gentleman at, from out of state, Justin Van Dersen, not that Justin, um, but he was doing his own family research. He is a descendant of the um, Leva family, uh, which were Italians um, who moved to Monroe County for the limestone industry. Uh, so this was not uncommon at the time, and we are we do know of uh, families of Italians who did this. And uh, But this, he was looking specifically for his family, and he found in our collection, specifically this donation, many photographs of carvings that he knows his great-great-great-grandfather, Harry Leva, carved. This is Harry Leva's son, Luigi, also known as Gigi, uh, Leva, so that's him right there. And so like we had no idea who this person was and Justin came along about a month ago and was like, that's Gigi. Uh, we still have no idea who this is, but clearly he's not important. Um, but uh, so we, he was able to identify based on his family records of their projects and their work that this is one panel of a multi-panel carving, which 
illustrates uh, agriculture and industry, possibly of Florida, because there is a lot of, based on like the kind of agriculture, palms and water, and then some of the other panels, um, we're thinking maybe it's possibly Florida. Um, but it was also done in 1938 because he does have the records of the, the sale happening in 1838 for the Inglestone Company in Bedford. So it's not actually Victor Olytic, but um, it's a fun, like this is all information that we had no idea beforehand. So this is really helpful for us um, to find out this information and fill in this record so that in the future we can use this. So exhibits. Um, so in addition to collections, we also show the collections through exhibits. Um, we have permanent and rotating galleries. We have two rotating galleries right now, and um, uh, the Cook Gallery is a semi-permanent space, and the Brown Gallery is a semi-permanent space. So uh, that just means that the topics uh, do not change, like the limestone industry will always be there, but the topic within that limestone industry will change. So we will get new content, but you'll still always be able to come to the History Center and see something about limestone. Um, and then obviously we uh, tell history, uh, tell stories from Monroe County and use the collections to do so. And then um, industry, we, the, the range of subjects of our exhibits is wide, it's, could be anything. Um, so industry, history, arts and culture, um, events that have happened, that sort of thing. This is from our most recent exhibit that has since closed on the restoration of the Alexander Memorial. So I hope you were able to come to it. Um, but this brings me to our next slide there. Um, currently uh, on display right now is one of the largest exhibits we've ever had at the History Center. It takes up three galleries, which is insane. Um, but it is breaking the news, the past and uncertain future of local print journalism. So with the recent Herald Times collection, which I have presented to the History Club before, um, so you can go to YouTube and watch that one, um, the, the acquisition of the Herald Times collection um, to the History Center kind of sparked this idea of what does, what does the newspaper history of, of Monroe County look like? How many have we had? What have, who has owned what, um, and then what does that kind of look like for the future? Uh, with the sale of the building on South Walnut, we we're kind of like, where, where is it going? What's, what's going on with the newspaper? It's getting thinner and thinner. And so we're a little bit worried about that. Uh, do I have an answer for that? No, I don't. But um, I'm hoping to draw attention um, to that problem with this exhibit. Um, it is up until December 30th, so I hope that you can come and take a look. Um, also, here's a plug, um, tomorrow morning, um, you can come to the History Center. We're gonna open an hour earlier just for this. Um, the HT Collection, What's in the Photo program is happening tomorrow. Um, so I will be pulling photographs from the HT Collection that we have no idea what's going on. And it could be a person, a, a building, a, an event, a press conference, something like that. We're just really not sure who these people are, what's going on. Um, and so we're asking you all, we're asking the public. And so you can come in. Um, tomorrow we'll have coffee, juice, and bagels. And uh, you can help us identify what's, what's going on in the photo. Who are people? See if you know some of these people. Um, so hopefully that will, um, will help us clarify what's going on. Also, in addition to um, the monthly uh, what's in the photo uh, programs, we're going to be having a discussion panel. We're having three discussion panels. So this is the first one on the history of local news. September 30th, which is a Saturday from one to three, we're going to have local newspaper experts like um, Bob Salzberg. Um, now I'm blanking on everybody else. Who? Bob, Bob Hamill's gonna be there. Hmm. Janice Rickert's gonna be there. Somebody else. No, Laura Lane's not on the panel, but um, Anyway, it'll be a panel, a moderated panel discussion 
about just the history of um, the HT and working at the HT and what did the, the beat look like in Bloomington at, um, in the past. So, um, and then the future discussions we'll have um, in October and November. So um, we'll announce that information coming soon. And okay, and so coming soon, so what are our future exhibits coming up? So this is kind of a sneak peek that not many people get outside the History Center of what's coming up for us. Um, next, not next month, that's September. Um, <laughs> October, uh, we have on the corner of History, Eagleson and David Baker Avenue. So we're gonna be dis uh, have a, an exhibit in the education room um, talking about the renaming of those streets and um, the history of Eagleson family and David Baker and why those streets were renamed. Also in time for Veterans Day, we're going to have, um, we're going to redo our military exhibit, which is in the Cook Gallery. So this is a semi-permanent exhibit. And so it's always on the theme of military, but we change it out regularly. So this change out is going to be on Medal of Honor recipient Gary Kisters. Um, and then for looking ahead in 2024, we're going to have Barnes of Monroe County. So be excited about that, Barnes. Um, and then guest curator uh, Kelly Richardson from the Sage Collection is going to be doing an exhibit on senior chords. Um, the senior chords and the tradition of senior chords has seen recently seen a resurgence in high fashion of all places. Um, so that's very exciting. And so we're kind of tying in today's current fashion trends to this long-standing Indiana um, tradition. Um, total Eclipse of the Heart um, <laughs> is not about the song. It's about the upcoming eclipse. So uh, the eclipse is happening April 8th of 2024. Um, I hope you're all excited about it because Bloomington's right in the path of totality. Um, and we'll be having an exhibit on the 1869 uh, eclipse that was also happened in Bloomington. Punk at the old library. Um, there was that, Justin was talking about that time when, before the museum became the museum proper. We had this, uh, there was a brief period of time in the 80s and the 90s um, where we had extra space in the auditorium and we apparently hosted punk shows at the library. So <laughs> we're going to revisit that and um, uh, look at the, the bands that had performed at the, the old library. Um, apparently there was a, a block parties in front of the library, so we're gonna be um, trying that again. So it should be, some, it should be fun. Um, then we are also going to have guest curator Alonza Lawrence, who's um, going to be focusing on um, black gospel uh, choirs and gospel music in Monroe County. Uh, an exhibit on Woodlawn Trailer Courts and uh, black women's social clubs. So I hope that you make it out to the History Center hopefully several times um, in the coming years to, uh, to see these exhibits and to help out with that, becoming a member would be great because then you get in for free every time. So now I'm gonna hand it, uh, oh wait, I have one more slide. Okay, if you have an exhibit idea, I'm always happy to hear that, um, please contact me. My email is just curator at monroehistory.org or you can find that on our website and our phone, my phone number is up on our website as well. So uh, if you have an idea for a future exhibit, please let me know. Um, we do book our exhibits out quite far in advance. So 2024 is done, uh, 2025, almost done. Um, so if, if you have an idea, it might be a while before you see it, but uh, I'm always open to ideas. So please let me know if you have any. Thank you. All right, and then <clears throat> you folks are stuck with me again, so I'm here to wrap up our part of the presentation. So one of the things Michael asked us about when doing the presentation is talking more about what a museum does. I'm hoping, just we can do a show of hands. You didn't know you were gonna have a pop quiz at the end of this, but it's only two questions and you can't fail. Just raise your hand if you've ever been to a museum before. Just any, here, there, wherever, anywhere in the world. Excellent. And just out of curiosity, how many people have been to the History Center? I knew I liked this crowd. I say that every week and I find a new reason why. So I know some of you probably saw my presentation back in January, either in person or 
on YouTube. So if you could just keep quiet until some of the other folks have guessed. But there's three basic things any museum does. Does anybody want to call out what one of those, what you think one of those might be? Preservation, preserving the past. That is one of them. Excellent. To inform. To educate is the one I'm looking for. That is perfect. So education and preservation. And what else do we do? What was the second word you used? Or the third? Collection. We, like, like Hillary was just talking about, we pull in all that stuff, whether it's your knowledge, because there's a lot of knowledge in this room. When we had the last what's in a photo, those people had so much fun. If any of you were there, they were saying, oh, this is so-and-so. I bet it's the press conference for this. They had all this knowledge they didn't realize that was so helpful in addition to things that we have. So in a nutshell, we collect, we preserve, and we educate. That, that is any museum you go to, you can break it down into this. And so a lot of people don't realize the extent of what we do. So for collecting, there's several basic questions. Hillary touched on a few of these, but does it relate? I cannot tell you how many times I've been at a museum and somebody will say, oh, my uncle lived in Alaska his whole life. He used this in Alaska his whole life. I want to donate this to the Monroe County History Center. I'm sure it's a fantastic artifact, and we mean no disrespect, but that is something that should go to that town in Alaska where your uncle was. So we always make sure it relates here so that other people can enjoy it. And can we care for it? That is a big, big question. For instance, when Hillary mentioned the newspapers, some of the ones from the HT that we were asked to take on, some of the big bound volumes, were literally disintegrating. You, you, you can't even read them, and there's no way to reverse that. So if we can't care for it, we shouldn't be pouring our time and our resources and our energies into that. We need to preserve things that can be saved, that can be admired. And also, uh, and also with that, uh, how big is the size? You might want to donate one thing, but if it's a train car, no matter how beautiful, I don't know if you've been inside the museum, it's going to make some really tight squeezes if we try to get a train car in there. But if you have something unique, a quilt, a photo, something like that, that is much easier. If you have 10,000 postcards, we might have to think twice because that's a lot of space. But that's why Hillary is here. She talks to a lot of people. Gabby is here. They let people know what's relevant and what's not, and if we can honestly care for it. We don't want to take people's items in and then have those people watch them as they fall apart. That's not fair. So that's why Hillary's job is so important. And finally, is there a need? Do we need 10,000 Monopoly games at the History Center? Probably not. But if somebody can show, for instance, if Hoagie Carmichael came to their house and was playing on a board of Monopoly, that's a neat story. That's something that not everyone can say. So that's some of the things that Hillary and Gabby put into and talk to people about when they're considering collections. And also preservation. We talked a little bit about this, the long, slow march to deterioration. Every object we have, today is the best day for the rest of its life. It might be very minuscule, but everything is slowly breaking down. And what Hillary and Gabby and our whole core of volunteers that help them do is they're trying to preserve all of this for as long as possible. So today's ch children that visit us, their grandchildren's grandchildren can still come see us. And they can still see these artifacts and objects and admire them. So that's one of the big things. And best practices. There's always new things coming out. For a long time, does anybody have photo books from the 1980s or 90s, and they have those magnetic backs, and they're all plastic, and the sheet? Turns out those aren't great for preservation practices. If you've gone back and looked at them, if you haven't recently, I suggest you might do that. Uh, but some of the older scrapbooks from the 1920s and 30s with the little corners that just barely hold, those do better than those plastic sheets that are on your on your book. So even if you go to Hobby Lobby or Michael's and it tells you this photo book is museum archive quality, Hillary will back me up on this, I can promise you. They can put that on there and there's no standards for that. So if you have questions about that, again, that's why we're here, it's not just our collections, 
you can ask us questions and we can help direct you in the right, right way to save your, your items. And then upkeep. Poor Michael gets to hear about this a lot. I didn't notice any other board members, but there might be a few in the audience. Some of our poor board members will hear, oh, we need more money for this, or we're, we're, we wanna put this in the budget next year. And they'll go, we, we already have UV filters on the windows, why, why do we need more? Well, after about 10 years or so, it breaks down. Those UV, fil those UV rays from the sun never stop. So we have to take the old ones down, put a new set up. So it's a continual process. Same with our collections. We might have an acid-free box items go into, but sooner or later, it's gonna absorb the acid and that needs to be replaced. So there's always a need and cost per cubic foot. When I was in graduate school, there was a study done. So between what the staff costs, electricity, running HVAC, general building insurance, fun things like that, it was over $360 a cubic foot. And if you've been upstairs and seen our collection area, or if you've been through the second floor exhibits and you look at all of that space, start running those numbers through your head because that's one cubic foot was over $350 about 15 years ago. So I'll let you do the math because I was a history major, not a math major. So I'll let you handle that. Um, and the final thing is educate. And this is a really, really big one. People automatically think of, oh, you have an educator. She goes out and talks to schools or they visit you. You're exactly right. But we also do things, we have internships. We have a great university just down the street from us. We also have Ivy Tech or high school students. We wanna help educate them so that way we're, we're creating a future for all these future uh, young folks to replace us at our jobs. We have a research library. We want to provide access to it. I know several volunteers from our research library are here. I'm not going to embarrass David Lemon too bad. But if you come in with a question, you want to know more, there's some amazing people back there and they can find about anything. If they don't know it off the top of their head, they know exactly where to look. And then also rotating our galleries. That's part of education. You come in, we're not gonna give you a quiz, I promise. We're not gonna ask you how many newspapers have been in Monroe County. But you can go to what attracts you and you can learn more about anything of interest and you get to feel good about learning something at your own pace and however much you want. So that, that's our role is we wanna do outreach. We wanna connect with the community. My biggest thing I've said at any museum I've been at, hopefully knock on wood, it doesn't happen. But if, if there was a giant sinkhole and it swallowed up our museum, in 200 years, if they open that up, do we adequately represent our community? That is, that is a big question. And so that's why we always want to do outreach. That's why Hillary asked for new ideas. For anyone that does have a membership, you've dealt with Justin. He's very friendly. He's able to get a lot of information from folks and say, hey, a lot of people have been asking about doing an exhibit on. And so he's able to collect. So we're always trying to listen to our community and how best to serve you, and that's what we try to do. So if anyone has questions, not just for me, but Justin and Hillary are just over here, so you are absolutely welcome to ask us now or afterwards, and we thank you for your time and listening to us today, and hopefully we'll see you soon. Sorry, yes. Appreciates our newspaper exhibit that's up.
And it's not just the big newspapers, it's any and all newspapers that have been throughout our history and her connection with her grandmother when she would turn in her handwritten column. So we tried to, to incorporate as much as we could. So I'm guessing you will encourage everyone to come see the exhibit. You give it, I think that's two thumbs up. So if you've not seen it, there's a recommendation right there to come see it. Yes, sir. You mentioned Carnegie Library. Do, do, do people here know what state has the most Carnegie libraries in the country? Indiana. I think I asked that once. Indiana by far. Why? Maybe they needed them? I don't know. Do you want to talk more about it? Well, if no one else has any questions, thank you again. And we'll be over here with books or memberships or to ask any questions. We have little flyers for the garage sale and our upcoming events if you need a little reminder to take home with you. So thank you again, everybody.